And welcome to This Is Rise Up Your Goal with myself, London Belu, and I'm taking you all the way till 12 p.m. You can stream us live on www.jerbuk.org.za. Talk to us on our social media platforms. We are Jerbuk Pals underscore on Twitter and Jerbuk Pals Radio on Facebook. And also, Jerbuk, listen, right now, the very first hour is dedicated to your hashtag Jerbuk updates, and that is on the Pals information about everything and anything that you need to know about the city of Johannesburg. And with that said, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I do have a very, very special guest this morning. She is our brand new executive mayor, a councillor, Dr. Mpopaletze. For the city of Johannesburg, she has made history 124 years. Uh, and now she is the very first female uh, to be part of the city of Johannesburg as the mayor. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Good morning. How are you doing, Mayor? Good morning to you. Good morning, Johannesburg. I'm excited to be on Joburg Pulse. Finally, Joburg has grown. So exciting. Finally. I mean, we've been wanting to have you here on the show. But first things first, you know, let's talk about the journey to becoming the executive mayor of the city of Johannesburg. You know, how has that been? Where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's been really an 11 year journey. It was 11 years ago that I decided to move to Johannesburg. Um, I was doing well. I was working for myself as a medical doctor. I had contracts with SASA doing disability assessments. And one of my officers that I was servicing was Khanisa, a very poor, underdeveloped village in the northwest province. And while I was there, I was getting applicants who were asking for a disability grant with no disability. A lot of them were uncontrolled diabetics or a woman that had had three cesarean sections, for example. And I soon realized that these people were poverty stricken and that there was no development and no employment opportunities in their area. I became growingly concerned about the living conditions and I realized, however, that I did not have adequate skills to address their issues. Mm. Yes, I had studied. I had done um, two diplomas in project and program management. But I still felt even with that, I needed more. And so I started researching and I found a course, um, public health medicine. And I applied to three universities, Medunsa, University of Pretoria and Wits. And Wits was the first one to have a vacancy and they accepted me. So 2011, I made the move to Johannesburg 10 years ago. I did the course for four years, an experiential learning um, course full time with Wits University. And at the end of the four years, as I was transitioning into restarting my business, I decided to take up a few opportunities in, in the process of transitioning. And one of them was doing casualty sessions in Alexandra at the Alex CHC Community Health Center. And while I was there, I was confronted with yet another poverty-stricken environment where, I don't know if you've been to Alex, but the living conditions, very concerning. And everything ended up in our casualty. You know, the aggression, the anger of community members led to such violent Acts and many of that ended up in, 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 our, in our casualty, the culmination of which became one Sunday morning around 5 a.m. I had been on call since the Saturday morning and five young men were wheeled into our casualty, each one with multiple gunshot wounds. And we lost two. Um, they died in our hands. We transferred three to Charlotte McLeke. Out of the three, two died there. Only one survived. And I'm told they were all sitting together. I don't know if they were brothers or part of a gang or friends, but somebody just came and opened fire on all of them. That made me very angry. But, you know, it was a build up of many such cases that I had seen throughout that week. In my anger, I started writing to various people and I cried for a whole week and I could not stop crying. And I read realize at the end of the week that I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because there's such a huge burden and I will not be able to just carry on like I had not seen what I had seen. And so I wrote to one of my friends who was a member of parliament at the time, Dr. Heinrich Walmink. And I said to him, why is government allowing people to live like this? What are you guys doing? And he threw the ball back in my court and he said, well, have you ever thought of becoming a counselor and being based in Alex and helping drive their issues? I said to him, well, I've got plans. I've applied for office space. I'm about to restart my disability practice. I had done a diploma in road accident fund work and I was looking forward to starting that work. 
And he said, well, you can still do that and, and become a part-time counselor. Don't apply to be a ward counselor. And so I started the application process. I applied to the Democratic Alliance to be one of their PR counselors. And in 2016, we ended up in a coalition government. The then mayor, um, Herman Mashaba, decided that I should become one of his MMCs for health and social development. And as we're walking from his announcement of his MMCs to the press briefing, I'm told by a regional chairperson that, oh, by the way, this is a full-time job, so you have to drop everything else that you're doing. And in that moment, I became a full-time politician. And that was five years ago. I think your work is just absolutely inspiring. But I just want to know, right now, you are in this big, big position as, you know, the executive mayor, again, of the city of Johannesburg. You know, um, what does this title mean to you? And how has, now, now that you are in this position, you know, how has that been and the transition? I, I see the title and I see people's interest in the title, but my interest is more in the function or the responsibility that comes with the title. Um, you can hear from my story that my pull into the space was really a longing to help people Absolutely. and to resolve problems that I see in society. A lot of it have to do with how we govern and how we steward the resources that are given to us by ratepayers who trust us to be their voice and to carry out their mandates as we govern. And so I wanted to lead that process. Of course, I became an MMC for three years. The three years that Herman Mashaba was mayor um, after he resigned, I then became an ordinary councillor. But the problems persisted. And I, I saw this deterioration in the state of the city, particularly in the last two years and I knew that I can't just carry on um, as if this is not happening. I had gained enough experience as an MMC to understand the system, to understand what needs to be done and I wanted to apply that and offer my services and my skills as a leader of other leaders who will jointly work towards turning the city around. So that's what it means to me. It's a golden opportunity. It's an opportunity to get things done, an opportunity to do things right, an opportunity to instill culture change where there needs to be culture change there's a lot of leaks in the system where money is lost through corruption fraud maladministration amongst other things there's a culture of non-payment for services whether it's big business or big government departments in some instances even affording residents who just choose not to pay their bills so all those things we need to educate people and mobilize the whole of society towards building the city, help them understand that every rand counts and that it's going to work for them in, in, in the first place. And and so you've done that, you've got your finances in order, and then you need to have programs that you're going to roll out to, re to respond to the challenges that you're seeing on the ground. You need strategy, you need to understand what is going on and, and craft um, very, very um, customized strategies to resolve those issues. And I'm just hoping that I'll have a good team of MMCs, I will be announcing them soon, who will assist me in doing that. Absolutely. Now, uh, may I please talk us through um, your view vision and priorities as the city of Johannesburg mayor, where exactly are you going to be focusing on? I came in as a DA mayoral candidate with my own manifesto promises, which I gave to residents during my campaign. And I came in with my own 100 days um, wish, wish list, if you will. But the truth of the matter is, we are a minority government. And I have said that the reason why there's been a delay in appointing MMCs is because we don't want to remain a minority government. We've seen, we've seen too much instability in the city in the last five years. We would like to stabilize the council, stabilize the city by including other political parties in our government and, and even offering some um, MMC positions so that it's not just the Democratic Alliance in the executive, but what that then means is that we need to open up for inputs from those parties so that our plans are reflective of the multi-party nature of our government. However, just to talk to the plans that I came in with, um, we had a seven pillar strategy that we offered to our residents. The first being basic service delivery. As you see, there's a lot of electrical outages, water outages, mainly because our infrastructure is aging and it hasn't been upgraded for many many years we will be investing heavily in upgrading our infrastructure and ensuring that we reduce the number of outages um, we will we'll work on improving our water environment um, electricity supply environment our roads uh, making sure our streets are clean and making sure there's proper sanitation across the city the second pillar talks to a safe city 
through integrated policing and better working relations with the South African police services, private law enforcement, as well as community law enforcement organizations, and also strengthening our smart a policing strategy by capacitating the intelligence operating center and working with the command center that's been put together by the provincial government. Thirdly, we want to give people a pro-poor city, a city that has support programs to bring people out of poverty into a better place and also programs to help various vulnerable communities including women, children, persons with disabilities, youth, the LGBTIQA plus community, people with substance abuse problems and our senior citizens. So those are just some of the programs. We also want to give people a business friendly city. The business community is begging us to please stabilize the city and bring back functionality so that businesses can function. If there is no water and no electricity, business cannot function, the economy cannot grow, and jobs are lost. So it is our responsibility to create an enabling environment for business to thrive, help us grow the economy, and create the jobs that are needed. But we also want to improve how we interface with the business community and, and making it um, uh, the city of Johannesburg a business-friendly city. Number five, we want to give people an inclusive city. We want to upgrade informal um, settlements. We want to improve our development planning framework to make for a more inclusive city of Johannesburg. But we also want to provide people with different modalities for housing provision, including giving people serviced stands with water, electricity, and ablution facilities where they can build their own homes. We also want to give them different rental options, including rent to buy options. Number six, we want to give people a well-governed city through e-governance solutions, so a 24-hour call center, an online portal with real-time tracking of queries and quick turnaround times for resolution of those queries, just as an example. And number seven, we want to offer people a smart city. You've seen with COVID, a lot of us are having to function remotely, even our city employees, many of them having to work from home. But you've got a learner in Alex that also needs to learn from home during high levels of lockdown. With connectivity issues and the digital divide, we're very concerned about that and that's something that we will be addressing. But we also want to start employing smart solutions even in how we run government, particularly in the procurement space, in the recruitment space, to help us function more efficiently and also to curb um, corruption in all those spaces. Mm, fantastic. Uh, now, Maya, I know that um, you've taken upon yourself to deal with uh, the Soweto Eskom issue. Can you tell us more about that and also what can uh, affected, you know, uh, residents, you know, um, just what, what, what do they need to know? So, firstly, I have not taken it upon myself to deal with the Soweto Eskom issue, but I recognize that I am a key stakeholder, you know, in a coalition of people that need to resolve the matter, Eskom being the main yes. stakeholder. So, in the city of Johannesburg, we've got Eskom supply areas and we've got city power supply areas. There are challenges in some Eskom supply areas, particularly in Soweto, where we've had disconnections of electricity by Eskom. Now, I've had a meeting with Eskom because I want wanted to understand, following complaints that I was receiving from residents on the ground, um, including a memorandum that was delivered to my office, I wanted to understand what exactly is the problem from ESCOM's point of view. And ESCOM explained to me that they are losing revenue in the Deep Blue Zone 3 area where we're having protests at the moment, as an example, where they've lost 96 million rands in the past eight months alone due to illegal acts people connecting illegally to the grid, people bypassing meters, and people buying electricity from ghost vendors. What happens when you buy from a ghost vendor is that they generate coupons that indeed give you ESCOM electricity, but the money does not go to ESCOM. It goes to these criminal syndicates, and the, the electricity will be cheaper, and so people would rather buy from them than buying from ESCOM. Now, because of all of that, ESCOM is not receiving the revenue that it needs to receive from this community, and therefore cannot afford to continue Continue to service the community. I think what the community does not always understand is, is that it costs money to run the service, to maintain the service, maintain the infrastructure. And when ESCOM is not able to recover the money that it's putting into the service, then it becomes unsustainable in the long run. And I think ESCOM has just reached a stage where they realize they're going to have to cut people off and, and, and at least charge them a fine. What ESCOM is actually charging the people, the six 
6,000 rands is not even what is owed to ESCOM. It's just a reconnection fee. If you, if you look at the number of households, they're talking about 700 households that were found to be in contravention of the law. However, um, they're asking for 6,000 rands. If you do the math, it, they'll only recover just over 4 million rands, nowhere near the 96 million they lost in the last eight months alone. So, you know, there's also a lot of misinformation peddling that's going around about ESCOM wanting to recover um, the debt from people. It's not true. ESCOM is just asking people to pay at least a reconnection fee. So they have a little bit of money to maintain the infrastructure and actually give them the service that they so deserve. So that is um, what's going on currently. I have undertaken to work with ESCOM to engage the community so that we start to see an improvement in behavior because criminality is actually working against the people. They're now without electricity because of those criminal acts. If those were not happening, this would not be happening. Also the culture of non-payment amongst people who can afford. We recognize that there are people who cannot afford to pay for electricity. And that's why the city, along with many other municipalities, has a package of services or, or rebates and subsidies that are given to those kinds of people. Here in Johannesburg, we call it the ESP, the Expanded Social Package, where people who can't afford can apply to receive certain rebates and, and subsidies, including getting free basic electricity, free basic water, amongst other benefits. We encourage people to register for ESP if they genuinely cannot afford to buy electricity. But if you're not registered for ESP, then you must pay for your services. That is just the way it works. That's how it's working in other parts of the city. And it's unfair on those ratepayers who are having to now incur tariff hikes year on year to make up for the loss of revenue in non-paying areas. So we really need to, in the spirit of fairness, ensure that as much as some residents are paying, others also pay, and those who can't afford are then assisted through the ESP framework. Absolutely. I think that also, I mean, we as Joburg Pals, uh, we, I believe that we are the people who the, the, the organization where we drive information to the people because I, I feel like, you know, we lack information. The residents of Johannesburg lack information. Like what you've just said right now, for me, I'm like, oh, wow, fantastic. This is a platform where also we are ensuring that if each and every single person, if you are not on social media, you can listen to your radio and listen to these type of conversations that we're having right now. But I mean, uh, Maya, it's been a very difficult two years. You know, COVID-19 has has been very devastating, for lack of a better word. Now, I want to know from you, now we've got this new variant, uh, Omicron, right? Omicron, yeah. So um, should tourists be af afraid? Um, should the arts industry, because for the past year and a half, a lot of people have lost their sense of income or their income? Well, so I come from a political party that's been opposed to lockdowns and that has been calling for an end to lockdowns. Um, however, you know, the National Department, through advice from the National Command Council, has been exercising lockdowns and you know we're now in lockdown level one. We would like to encourage residents to adhere to the regulations that are gazetted by our government, including all the safety protocols that are therein. If we can all respect those protocols, there will be no need to go into higher levels of lockdown. The reason why government often feels the need to scale up or to, 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 to go into higher levels of lockdown is when we see an increase in the number of cases, an increase in the number of complications and, and ultimately in the number of fatalities from the virus. Now, if we can be responsible and observe, you know, the basics, um, for instance, we were raiding nightclubs on Friday with the JMPD, just looking at how they're managing um, around COVID protocols. And it was really, really frustrating to see how they're not checking how many people are inside their clubs. They're supposed to be keeping track because there are stipulations in terms of the, the regulations of how many people are supposed to be in a space to make for social distancing. People are need to go in, be screened. That's not happening in any of those nightclubs. They're supposed to keep a register of who is there so that should there be one case of COVID, you can do easy contact tracing to prevent other people getting complicated disease. They're not even keeping registers. They're not sanitizing 
criticizing people. People aren't wearing masks. They're not even opening windows. And some of those spaces don't even have windows. So you realize that a lot of what's happening with us having to go into higher levels of lockdown is actually self-inflicted. It's actually because of our own non-compliance with the basic regulations. And if we can do that, we can prevent a lot of what we've seen in the past with the economy crumbling and a lot of our industries being affected by these lockdowns. So I think that we need to start taking a collective responsibility as society so that we prevent um, a, a worse scenario than what we find ourselves in right now. Fortunately, with Omicron so far, it looks like it's having only mild symptoms. We're not really seeing very complicated um, COVID cases from this particular strain. It is still early days. Researchers are still watching very closely to see if it would develop differently. But so far, we've seen that a lot of people are able to isolate um, and they're able to recover without any severe um, symptoms. But it is early days and we should not take advantage of that. We must continue to be compliant with lockdown regulations. I mean, with, with COVID regulations. Absolutely. Now, uh, Maya, I, as a young person, believe that there's just so much power and healing in representation. Now, the fact that you are the first woman uh, mayor for the city of Johannesburg, what do you hope that will represent and what does that mean to women in leadership? Well, the first message is that women can do anything that they put their minds to. Um, I decided that I want to be part of the solution. I want to help design and roll out um, programs that will uplift society. I did it as a human being first and as a woman second. But because I stayed so committed to my vision and I prepared and I equipped myself through education and through exposure to, you know, all the training, mentorship, coaching that I need, um, I'm here today. My message to women is do not expect to get things on a silver platter just because you're a woman, you know. Go into any space you want to go into. Do not allow yourself to have limitations imposed on you, but you also have a responsibility to prepare yourself so that you are the best man for the job and, and that you get it on, 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 on those merits and not just because you're a woman. So that once you're in that position, you're able to deliver and you're able to be faithful with what you've been trusted with. And also women need to put their hands up. Sometimes women are capable, but when there are men in the environment, they tend to stand back and allow the men to lead. Women need to know that they are equal. They're not the other. They are just as equal and they, just, they have just as much of a right to to lead as men do. Um, so fortunately, I come from an environment where women leadership is key, it's supported, and we've seen many great women leaders, um, even in my party. And so, you know, I've, I'm really grateful for the kind of support that I've, I've received thus far. And I believe that I will continue getting that support as we together turn Joburg around. Absolutely. Now, Maya, before I let you go, um, I'd like to ask my guests. I know that you have a very, very busy schedule, right? So what do you do to unwind? Like if you're not busy working, uh, what do you do that, you know, makes your mind very relaxed? So I'm a creative at heart. Um, there's, this is one part of my life that I've never been able to fully express because I'm also an academic and because I'm academically inclined, um, people tend to push me into those professional and academic spaces. But I do find time to express my creative side. Um, I love music. I love to write. Um, I write music as well. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, I, I've been a worship leader at church, so I used to sing as well. And, and so I, I use my downtime to find creative expression because that's the only time I can do it. And yeah, that's something I really enjoy. But I also love spending time with family. Family is everything to me. I'm an only child and I grew up with my mom and dad. I'm also an only child. Oh, okay. hey, <laughs> wow. so you understand. <laughs> so we've always been a very close knit family and I always wanted a big family of my own. And I've got three children by the grace of God. I'm so grateful. And we are a really lovely big family now and I enjoy spending time with my mom, my dad, and my children, the best thing for me to do. 
Executive Mayor, thank you so much for your time. I really do hope that uh, we'll have this conversation again on Joburg Pulse Radio because um, there's a lot of issues that I also want to talk to you about. I mean, uh, unemployment, youth unemployment, uh, which has been a very, very big threat in the country and in Johannesburg right now. But uh, conversation for another day as well. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me and I will definitely be back. Awesome, man. That was our Executive Mayor, Councillor, uh, Dr. Paul Balat, talking everything that has to do with her being the new executive mayor of the city of Johannesburg with city of Johannesburg I beg your pardon I feel like also I'm just you know because I, I I was receiving so much information and I feel like you know I, I I'm just trying to absorb everything but Joburg thank you so much for choosing us and allowing us into your space right now 20 minutes up until we reach top of the hour 11 a.m on Joburg Pulse Radio once again you can stream us live on www.joburg.org.za now the very first hour is dedicated to your hashtag Joburg updates and that is on the Pulse information about everything and anything that you need to know about the city of Johannesburg Keep it locked.